So now what's happening is uh, we're streaming live uh, to YouTube. We are using this as a follow-up session to talk about uh, digital literacies and how to work in hybrid and blended spaces in uh, higher education. Um, I have a Google presentation slides that I set up. I'll share those out. But uh, as always, uh, the, the most meaningful part of our time is a little bit of dialogue and questions. Um, so I'll share these on my screen. All right, so that, let me maximize these. So once again, this is a opportunity to, let me make sure that I can get this running. Is that full, uh, full screen there in that room? Yeah. All right, so. So what we're going to talk about is how to be, uh, you know, digitally literate, how to bring in hybrid and uh, blended learning into our classroom, how to make some of these digital texts and tools work for instruction, for teaching and learning, but also build up our digital identity in these online spaces. This is a, uh, you know, through literacy and technology, there's multiple opportunities to change how we work. There's multiple opportunities to prepare our students. Um, and the challenge in all this is that our classroom is changing and pedagogy is changing because of these new digital literacies that are impacting uh, how our students interact in classes, what their expectations are, uh, what their needs are. And it's difficult for us to constantly adapt to these changes. Uh, my time with you today. I thought we'd focus on a, a three different things. Uh, once again, this is follow-up from an earlier session. I got the opportunity to come up and visit uh, in March, uh, spend a, a good weekend and see snow again, uh, and, and had the opportunity to work with a great group of people to talk about how to make all this happen. The materials from that last session are up online. So we have a blog post that's out there with uh, all of the presentation materials from before. We have the videos, uh, Blue Jeans. We used it to capture the video from the sessions. Uh, we talked about how to scaffold students and exactly what is hybrid and blended learning. We talked about how to change and modify pedagogy across these spaces. Uh, we talked about how to build digital learning materials. So all of the materials from that day-long session are up online and supplemental materials. So if at any point I talk about something today that seems a little bit strange, please understand that a lot of these materials are out there online for you to go back and revisit. Um, but also, uh, Carol can share my contact material. I'll share in the, in the, you know, in the presentation materials. Get in touch. Stay in touch with me, and, and we'll talk about ways to make this happen for you. So one of the things, uh, first we're going to talk about how do you build online hybrid learning opportunities and how do you change? Uh, how do we, secondly, create digital copies of these learning materials? And then third, start up that digital learning hub to archive materials and possibly share. This is where we left things on our previous meeting. And so what I'll do is I'll present some of the materials and then we'll have a little bit of dialogue about how to make this thing happen. So one of the first things that I think we need to talk about is we are in, you know, our students are in these hybrid online learning spaces. Uh, many times uh, our classes meet face to face. Sometimes our classes will meet totally online. Um, you know, we hear a lot about these blended or hybrid learning opportunities. Um, and the, the, the key thing to remember is that our students learn or they have the opportunity to learn across all of these spaces. So our our registrar, uh, you know, in our course catalogs will identify specific classes as totally online or totally face-to-face, -face. Um, but we have the opportunity to move across hybrid spaces with our students if we so choose to. Um, in my classes, I have classes that meet, uh, you know, two or three times a week for an hour and a half to three hours, uh, depending on uh, how often we meet. 
I will build in online spaces to have them read and write, connect, uh, and talk with one another uh, to try and supplement. So what does hybrid or blended mean? Uh, hybrid or blended really is just mixing place and space. Some of us, uh, it, the, in the research, it, there are different percentages that we talk about hybrid and blended and learning. Um, you know, how many, how many, how, what percentage of seat time face to face as opposed to totally online. Most of those percentages don't really mean anything. What matters most is your uh, content area, it ma uh, your pedagogical standards, and your pedagogical techniques, and how you can modify those. A question? What? Yeah, I have a question. One second. You're on mute. Is it just I'm just pressing no, the, I can hear you guys. Visible screen. Cover the mouse. This one? Draw the mouse. Yeah, and then you click on that. Uh, ah, there. Okay. Hover up here again, and then, yeah. So. You just muted yourself. Now we're not on mute. Ian? Yeah. Ian, can you hear us? Yeah, of course. Darn it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's see. Is my is my audio coming through to you? Yeah, it was. You're off for about a minute. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So um, Ian, um, it was Kevin Feeney. I was at your earlier session. Yeah, um, of course. Here, and we brought in a um, an accounting professor from another school that was teaching online courses because we wanted firsthand experience as to how you do it. And it, you said the percentages didn't matter, but at his school they were coming up with kind of a, not a ranking, but a rating system, and they were saying that a course could be as much as 25% online and still be considered to be a traditional course. So I just wanted to throw that in, that people were looking at this, saying even in a, you know, maybe what you're calling a blended course, but his school was allowing up to 25% online content in what they were considering to be a traditional classroom course. Yes. So it is you mean by blended? Yeah, so um, first of all... They, they were trying to, so the students, from looking at the course, you would know immediately up front what was the online content. You know? So they had like a, a, you know, different rankings. So I thought that was an interesting way of presenting it, so you knew exactly what you're expecting. Before they registered Before for the class. Before they registered for the class. Yeah, I agree. And first of all, it's good to see you again. Um, that's one of the challenges that we will have in all of this, is that... Um, with some of the, the online spaces, with blended or hybrid learning, it, it's up to the instructor how they mix and match those different elements of place and space. But I think that what we're seeing is registrars and universities are looking at different spaces and saying, okay, this is a totally face-to-face -to -face class, or this is a hybrid class, or this is a totally online class. Um, and they are trying to parse, uh, partial out what are the different percentages but I think one of the other key issues that we're having is that students have expectations. You know, students say, well, this is a face-to-face -face class. Why am I showing up to do online work? You know, why Why are you making me go online when I, you know, some students have, we have different ways of, quote, unquote, doing school. You know, they have expectations of, I, I show up during your class. It meets three hours on Mondays. I shouldn't have to do anything else during the other times of the week. And then the issue is that if there is a complaint, student goes to registrar, the dean, the department head, and says, why am I having to do all this other work? Then you have a difficult situation to talk about with the students. Or an online class where you have to show up to take the test in person. That yeah. Gave that as an example. Yeah. That's one of the challenges. When I was at um, University of New Haven, we had a program that was a hybrid blended program. We had students that were teachers in the state and during the summer and during uh, like winter break we would have those students come in and they would meet face to face for uh, some classroom visits. Pretty much it was three hours one night a week or maybe two hours a week depending on how many classes. During the school year our students were practicing teachers They were out in the field. They wanted the flexibility to go out and still do their job during the day but then tune in on their own time to get work done. Um, 
we had those classes were listed as totally online. When they registered, they were registered as an online class. The university recognized it as an online class. But then a lot of the students in the class and our faculty uh, that were teaching the classes, they wanted the opportunity to come in face to face a couple times. And so then we had dialogue between the students and the faculty um, and the department head about, OK, can we still meet a couple times, or are we basically making students do something they don't want to? So this is the, the easy answer to this, and understanding there's no easy answers is, I think for our purposes, when we receive classes from the university, they are identified as totally face-to-face -face and traditional, totally online. Um, but when we talk about blended or hybrid, there is an opportunity to mix time and place and space. Um, and I think depending on our programs, depending on our content, we, want, we, we might want to mix up and play with these ideas of place and space. Thank you. But part of this is having okay. a lot of – it's having – discussions as a faculty, you know, discussions as a department about what's meaningful. Uh, so we're for an accounting, um, you know, or if we're in business or, you know, teacher ed, wherever we are, what does the department want? What are the goals? And then making that clear to the students what the expectations are. You know, and that comes from department head, you know, dean department head down to the students to talk about here is what we do in our, in our classes. Um, in my classes right now, uh, my students meet, like I said, once or twice a week, a couple out, you know, three uh, hours a week. I tell them at the very beginning of the class that all of the materials are online and they will be doing work online in addition to the face-to-face -face time. I explain why I'm doing that. Um, I do get some pushback, uh, but I recognize that my teacher, my, my uh, evaluations uh, don't go down as much if I have honest dialogue with the students at the beginning and throughout. But it's a, it's okay, one of those challenging things. Uh, it's it's a challenge to understand what these hybrid blended spaces mean, but then also what are student expectations going into those environments? What are instructor expectations going into those environments? You might have faculty that says. I don't want to teach hybrid or blended. I just want to show up my three hours a week, teach my class. And when class is done, students know what the homework is. I'll see you next week. Good question, though. So. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the slides for a second. And please, once again, if there's questions, I know there's a little bit of lag on my end, but um, feel free to stop me, uh, and we can unpack a lot of this. this is a, a lot richer discussion if we all try and make sense of what's happening. So when we talk about hybrid or blended uh, learning, and this is a lot of stuff that we talked about previously, uh, keep in mind that we are mixing up time and place. You know, there is uh, synchronous and asynchronous learning. One of the benefits of asynchronous learning is that we allow students to push pause on learning. Uh, they can take a challenging subject and in class, face-to-face, -face, they might not uh, be able to jump in and immediately process what they're learning. They might need a little bit of time to think about it. They might need a little bit of time to go uh, digest and come back to it. You might have the, you might, you might want a little bit of deeper learning um, and deeper thinking about what the content area or the content might be. Um, so you might want to give them time to think and then respond back at a given time. Um, and then also we're dealing with different places and having the opportunity to uh, think about learning out in the world. So with synchronous, we're talking about things happening in real time. Asynchronous, we're talking about different periods of time. Um, and once again, one of the things I want you to think about is what happens when I allow students to push pause on learning? What happens when I don't expect them to immediately respond and immediately give me an answer? Um, in this, uh, there's also a question that we have about assessment and what challenges do we have as students uh, do work in our classes and we don't immediately assess their learning. Do we privilege one student, give one student a higher grade if they, in class, face-to-face, -face, can immediately have the quote-unquote right answer to a question? So in this, 
Uh, we can allow students to think. We can allow students to reflect. Um, we might not do this all the time in our classes, but with hybrid learning, you have the opportunity to have a face-to-face -face learning environment, but then give them a little bit of time to think about or uh, digest and decompress, and then come back and think about, you know, how do they how do they consider your content now after they've had a little bit of time to reflect. And one of the, the hardest things that we do in our classes is we try to provide opportunities to synthesize information, to connect all the dots between the, behind what we've been teaching and make sense of, of this uh, over time. Uh, hybrid learning really gives us opportunities to, I, I believe it gives us opportunities to create time for that synthesis. Um, in our classes face-to-face, -face, we might have uh, some lecture, we might have some hands-on activity, we might have students that are working together collaboratively. Uh, in these activities, we uh, have them face-to-face -face and we have time to support them face-to-face, -face, but then some students, they don't automatically press uh, go and connect and interact during our one and a half to three hours face to face in class. Um, so with hybrid learning there's an opportunity to, to push pause and allow them to think on their own and synthesize but then the question is how do we collect all that good work and how do we collect that thinking and bring it back into the class. So one of the things that I suggest is um, in terms of building up this, these uh, hybrid spaces and thinking about synchronous and asynchronous learning is think about one class, you know, and, and some people will think about one class or one section of one class and take one element, one module from that class and figure out a way to build in one element of online learning to that. Questions? Anybody have any questions? You say, um, so I teach management, and so I, we do a module on leadership. So I would take that one module and look at the textbook and see what I could put online versus what I cannot put online or what would be better in a classroom. Yeah, and, and, the, yeah, thing and the thing to consider to is, consider is when, we talk about better, when we talk about better, we're talking about Pedagogically, pedagogically, what will support the students? So you think about one class, class this teaching, teaching management. What is one aspect, one of, that aspect class of that class that makes sense and, and be relatively, be relatively easy, easy to teach an to online, teach online part? To so that. if we're moving from that to an online or blended class, Carol, you might want to show a season pattern. Oh, okay. That's what you wouldn't be in the textbook, right? You know, or some some other yeah. someone showing leadership or something. Okay. What was that? He, was that? Uh, he said suggested like a, a clip of Patton or some leader. You know, some something on a leader being a leader. Because um, I have a tendency to not ask them to read online, but rather um, they do quizzes online or they hand in papers online or they have group discussions about something like you know. Who would you think is a good leader? They do in a discussion board or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's what I have a tendency to do. But now, it, it, and, now and I agree. Yeah, I agree. What you can do is you can, you, can you can have students go and view go a and YouTube view clip a about Pat and their leadership, or leadership. You can have selected uh, blog posts about leaders about and leaders and leaders. have the students go online and review those. Uh, if you were having if students go students online and have discussion forums. forums you're building in some of those online spaces already. Okay. So you would meet face-to-face, -face, -face, but then you'd say, okay, typically at this point in my course, I would talk about you know, aspects of leadership and I have students go online, and they would uh, find a, a leader that really spoke to them or a leader that connected with them and identify leadership traits for that individual. They could, that would be having them start to go online and find information and bring it back into the class. That could be your online discussions, but it could also be you bring it into your face-to-face -face -face class. And you have the students say to you, okay, well, I, this week, I went online and I reviewed the video about Patton. I, I found my own leader and I found their primary text. I found a blog post about that person. 
have them come into class and and face to face talk with students in class or talk with uh, the, the the large group about what they learned, what they expected, what aspects of leadership resonated with them. Kevin, did you have a question? No, I was just going to say you can have multiple clips and okay. you know different leadership styles, and then you'll have the students watch them and. You know, what do they have in common? What are they different? From? Okay. I mean, you know, that's something that well, obviously is not in the text. The text can talk about different things, but right. you can kind of see it in action. The, Kevin raises a good point. Is there any formula or any, uh, I hate to say right answer. Uh, so if I'm doing a module on leadership, uh, do I need like a discussion board and uh, or pre-assessment discussion board and assignment and then a quiz? Is there any, you know, Formula or best practices or there really isn't. There really I mean, isn't. I mean, you want to think about, think about um, uh, you know that that, you know, that, that illustrious that term illustrious pedagogy. pedagogy. You know what works for teaching and learning. And, and earlier when we met in March, we had a lot of talk about the T Pack model and all those materials are online. The thing to remember is you are all an expert in the content area. That's why you got hired. That's why you got hired. You know, you're an expert in content area, you're an expert in marketing, you're an expert in business or in accounting. I'm not. I'm not. You know your content area and you also know um, the pedagogical dimension of that content area. You know how to really teach marketing well. You know when your students are resonating with the content and when they're not. So one of the reasons why I suggest you take one class that works and works well and figure out a small way to fold these online texts or these online interactions into that is if you take one section of one class and a small part and you start with that small dimension first, test it with your students and pay attention. See what's working and what's not working with them. Um, because they might not want to go online and view the videos. They might not want to go online and interact in these spaces. They might not want to have the discussions uh, online in addition to the face-to-face -face classes. It's something that you want to test out over time. Um, I've done a lot of research on how to frame those discussions, and what we'll notice is, and this is uh, higher level, this is looking at across classes and across, uh, across a program. One thing that we've noticed is if you sequence your classes across a program and you see different elements of instruction, you can see students building capacity over a program. So if you think about aspects of leadership, you might look at how the student uses leadership in one of the first classes in the sequence of classes in your program. You might start off with something easy at the beginning of the program, but then later on expect more and more uh, uh, synthesis, you know, and understanding and comprehension later on as they near the end of the program. But I think at the, at the start, what I would suggest is Build starting to slowly fold in elements of online stuff. Make it mostly supplemental um, and then seeing how it resonates with students. Okay, thank you. And there's also there's the question of assessment and how do how do we assess learning? How do we make sure that it's meaningful? Uh, uh, in the past, some of my classes I will have online posts and I'll have online discussions and I tested it once in the one class, class the, the online posts and the online discussion forums they were completely, um, I did not assess them at all. It was a supplemental piece. And then in the other class, the other section of the same class, I uh, made it a requirement. And what I've noticed in that, in that research piece was that the students that I did not assess valued the post more and they liked doing the online parts better than uh, the student that was a requirement. So there's a lot of weird uh, things happening with motivation. Um, you can go online and look at the Dan King videos about motivation on YouTube from uh, the TED Talks and the RSA Talks. But it's interesting to see how students, when they know that they're being assessed, um, what that does to their desire to desire. You might try and use it as a supplemental piece and say, here is this online component. It's primarily supplemental right now. 
now most of our discussions so will happen in class, and then slowly start to grow that over time. That over time. Ian, we had a question here. Um, um, someone asked that seems so counterintuitive of what you just said about the assessed the people who had to do it versus the people who didn't have to do it. And do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's um, I think it's, um it, it's an interesting it's piece an interesting because you wonder why, why the students the that, students that, that had, you know I if I have one I class and I say okay once a week you need to week, do, do a synthesis of blog post. post and then I have the other class that does the same does exact work but all I'm doing is in the other class I'm making it a requirement and assessing it. The group that was not getting was assessed, not getting and assessed, it was a supplemental, was a supplemental piece, piece, I think that I think many, that of, them many of them wanted to get it done to just, just to further engage, to with, further the engage with the work, further, further engage in the, in the uh, curriculum, and, and further engage with the discipline. I do have I have larger questions about why one group would get more value out of doing it out of just love of the content. It's intriguing. It's it is intriguing. very counterintuitive. It makes me question, makes me question um, uh, assessment practices. Assessment it makes practices. me question uh, the role uh, of my instruction in the class, uh, the role of their interactions in the class. Um, and, and so it's, so at this point, what I do is I do assess them when they are doing online discussions like that. But the end result is that my group of my discussions is very minimal. It's almost a binary group. And this is what we talked about in class previous when, when, when we met in March. Um, um, my rubrics for these online discussions and online posts are very minimal. It's almost binary. It's a 012 or a 0123 rubric for each week. And the rubric basically is, yes, I showed up and I engaged online and I connected and I did the work. And then maybe it related to the content or the discussion for the week. or a zero that I didn't do the work at all. So I'm okay. I'm trying to really get in between the yes, I'm really assessing and, and giving you a lot of feedback and really drilling down to what you did and the letting you do it just for the love of doing it. Okay. Oh yep, that. one second. Yep. Um, when we have the discussion forum and that's a that's a kind of media with a kind of purpose. When we have an open discussion, the purpose um, the, the, the discussion form, the media doesn't change, but the purpose is changing. So the audience, the writers, the media are all the same, but the purpose is different. So in one case, you have an assignment that has an answer. In the other case, you have a, 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 just a loose uh, array of students sharing their thoughts about uh, a discussion topic. So in one case, the purpose of the discussion form is to discuss and to relate to each other and to share feelings and to open up. And in the other case, the purpose is to deliver an assignment, which um, has its own purpose and an evaluation and isn't the open kind of discussion forum. That, uh, so the, I think that the fact that the, the medium is the same, um, it, the medium is not changing, but the purpose does. And it's yep. the purpose that we need to be doing. We have one more question, Ian, before you... One quick comment. quick comment. I think it's... Uh, one second, Ian. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Also, the source of motivation is changing. Yeah. One is intrinsic motivation. One is um, motivation that comes from the extrinsic. You know, if there's a grade associated with it, you're extrinsically motivated. Also, the other peers are going to be reading it because they are compelled to go on it. So their peers are going to see what they had to say. Yeah. So yeah. if it's optional, they don't know that their peers are going to be seeing it. So it isn't feeding their ego. Did you hear that, Ian? But yeah. Yeah, I agree 100%. It's selfie. They want everyone to see it. So that's why, that's that's why, why they want people with the compulsory one. No, the non-compulsory one. They want people to see, this is my selfie. Yeah, that's what I think. But if it's not compulsory, then your friends may or may not go on. They, they want their friends, they don't care. They just want to post. It's all about self gratification. Here, I, here's my selfie. I don't care if anybody else looks at it. I, it's there. I feel good because I posted. Multiple, multiple layers. layers. Yeah, yeah, multiple layers. It's terribly fascinating. Terribly fascinating. Um, a couple uh, different things. Different things. Uh, one, uh, one, I agree. I agree. 
uh, that the, the uh, purpose, that they, 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 when I have my students write, right, I'm thinking right, about purpose, right, audience, and design. and design. And so, what so is the purpose for why I'm there? there? When they are they discussing, are when they're when they're, when they're submitting work, they're work, work to you, there is one level of audience and authenticity to the work. And when they are submitting work, and they realize that other people, especially in the class, not openly online, but just students in the class, their level of authenticity and audience goes through the roof. So if I have students so submit, students to, submit me to me a literature, a literature review, review, and they just submit they the just literature, literature review, review to me as a Word doc or a PDF or a Google, 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 Google doc, there is one level of audience and authenticity. There's one level of effort in that work. But then all of a sudden, if they submit that work and it's to a discussion group, and it's to the online class where they know that other students in the class are viewing it and they will read it and have feedback, all of a sudden the level of work and audience and authenticity in the work product goes through the roof. Because then all of a sudden, and it seems counterintuitive once again, but they care more about the fact that other kids in the class can see their work and the, the level of quality, uh, they care more about that their peers can see what they do as opposed to what I do as the instructor. Don't know why, <laughs> um, but that's what we're seeing is that they know that if their their peers and other people in the class are seeing it, especially if you have students collaborate. Um, another quick thought about the, the the first comment and the second comment about the audience and authenticity is that this is we this is what we want our students to do. You know, this is we want our students to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk. You know, business especially needs students that can leave our programs, and they not only know the content, but they can open their mouths and talk about it, uh, and and make sense when they talk about it. Um, and so we're building up in these online spaces. We're building up the opportunity to have dialogue and talk, and the purpose of each of these might change. You know, you might have one discussion post that is read this online blog post or this is an argument that we had in class, let's continue to talk about it. And it might be a collaborative piece and you just want them to talk with each other. But then you might have another post, another section, another activity where the purpose completely changes and you want them to present a point or have some argumentative stance or synthesis or uh, deconstruct an argument. Um, so the purpose can change, but this you know, hybrid spaces give our students a chance to start talking and start talking about the content and making sense, hopefully, as they talk about content. And we know that that's hard to do. Okay. And the, 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 the last piece about, uh, you know, as individuals share online, I, I think the, the thing to keep in mind is that um, not all of our students are the same. We do have a lot of our students that um, will automatically want to create and just share things online. Um, I definitely share probably a little bit too much online. Um, my students, when they follow me through social media, through my classes, they they joke, or actually they're not joking at all. They you know say that they once they're done with me and my programs and stuff like that, I get blocked and then they move on, and I get that. Um, but I think that not everybody's like that. Some of us like to share and create and, and post a lot of things online, and some of us like to share in these discussion forums online, and a lot of our students don't want to do it at all. Um, I think that a couple of years ago, now it's almost a decade, uh, that, that term, the digital native, you know, now I, I think that that term set us back a decade or two. I think that we believe that young kids come into our classrooms and they are digital natives and they really just want to share and openly, uh, you know, build up this digital identity. I think that for the most part, that's not true. Um, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with age. It doesn't have anything to do with gender. Um, I think that just different people are wired different ways. Some of us like to create and share and express ourselves and try new things and be creative and you know. That happens in the digital space as well, and others don't. They don't want. They don't see the value in that. Um, in my own program, I see students that are juniors, and uh, and I, I'm going to see another group in a month uh, where the day one of class they are building a website and they're building up a digital portfolio over time. And I've had students that say right from the beginning, I don't want to have an online presence. And I'm like, you're a junior in you know in college. Like, don't you already 
and they're all over the place. Some students use a lot of online tools and build up a digital presence, and they're on Facebook and Twitter and elsewhere, and others don't have any presence at all. I have students that are juniors that they go online and they have a Facebook profile just so that they can monitor their parents and see what their parents are sharing. And I'm like, that's fascinating. Is that supposed to be the complete opposite? Um, but then the other thing that's really interesting to pay attention to right now is uh, tools like Snapchat. So you have tools like Snapchat where a lot of our students like it because they uh, it's, it's ephemeral. They have the opportunity to create something and it disappears after 24 hours. So to me, that doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, you know, the, the fact that I would share something, you know, we spend so many, so much of our time writing and revising and publishing so that it'll be there, um, or our teaching materials will stay there, whereas they like the opportunity to create something and it will disappear or fade over time. So there's different notions about what these digital spaces have for teaching and learning. In a sidebar, I'm testing out the use of Snapchat as a way to share, you know, lessons of the week uh, with students. I'm going to test it out this year and see what happens. I had dialogue with my uh, students that just wrapped up in May to see whether or not they would see this as being a value, and I've got 50-50 or uh, pretty much a 50-50 response of positive and negative to it. And some of the classes were more negative, and some of the classes were more positive in me just once a week on Snapchat saying, hey, this week in class, we will focus on these two or three themes. Um, so most of my students are, it, it was a mixed opinion at best as to whether or not my students wanted me to use Snapchat primarily as a way to announce things we'll work on that week in class. OK, thank you. So let's move on. Fascinating questions, though. All right, so one of the first things that we're talking about is uh, please take one thing, try one thing out, see how it works, move on. Um, you know, ask your students what they think. Um, obviously, there is a lot of um, built into this. There is a lot of trust between uh, you, your department head, um, you know, if if you try something out and it doesn't work well and your, your evaluations from students in your classes go down, will your department head, will your dean, will you know, TMP committees understand, hey, I'm trying new things? Um, because there's no, uh, you know, simple equation of what works and what doesn't work. It's constant testing. Uh, the other thing that we need to talk about is creating digital copies of learning materials. So in the earlier example, if you have a traditional textbook and you have students reading and you're talking about leadership and you have them go online and they find a couple of videos or you give them videos about leadership and, and looking at patent, you want to start to save that, that trail, that, that paper trail. Um, and save those materials so that when you test them in your classes, what worked and didn't work. And then the next semester, the next class, you might expand and you might include more digital copies or digital materials in your classes and see how that works. The stuff that worked in the previous classes, you obviously want to still use that. So we're talking about slowly building up digital copies of teaching and learning materials. So many of us, this is what our desk looks like. That's Actually, that's a lie. This is more what most of our desks look like. Um, you know, we we have uh, a mix of, of papers and digital content. Um, a lot of us have, you know, the uh, computer that has uh, hard drives full of all of our PDFs. We still have printed out copies of materials. Um, you know, on our computer at our office or on our laptop, we have everything that we possibly could need. Uh, so we can go to our desk and when we need a syllabus to hand out to students, we can print the syllabus and copy uh, the syllabi, uh, you know, for our students before class starts to hand it out. Um, but all of our stuff is either print, it's copies in a file folder, in a file cabinet, or we have stuff that's saved on our hard drives. 
um, and we can share that out once we have the opportunity to get back to that computer. And the challenge in part of this is if you're not in your office at your computer, can you get access to this stuff? You know, if you leave your office and you go to the classroom, can you get access to these materials? If there's an error in the materials, if you want to share the materials with the student, how easily can you get access to it? Um, and so that's one of the things that I want us to think about is how do we get digital copies of everything? Because a lot of our workflow is changing. You know, I mean, if we think about uh, how we teach online, when we're face-to-face, -face, totally online, or someplace in the middle with hybrid or blended learning, in our own lives, we have a lot of different texts that we use. So this is a colleague of mine. Let's see if I can use the laser pointer tool now. So now, like, this was a, a colleague of mine at UNH, so she's got her little track phone um, because she didn't want people to collect data on her. So she has a prepaid track phone. She's got a little PDA, Palm Pilot, to save addresses and everything. Uh, a big, nice Kindle. Uh, I don't think this is the paper white, but a nice e-reader. iPad, you know, university provided iPad. Uh, use that for some teaching and learning. But then there's also a lot of handbooks and teacher books and magazines and other texts. And these are, these are the types of texts that we use in our own day-to-day -day actions, sometimes professional, sometimes personal. But these are the things that we use in our own world. How do we start to think about how to use these things for teaching and learning, for our classes? All right, so if I go. So one of the things that I do, and I know that, I don't know how to turn off the laser. There we go. So one of the things that I do is I have everything in Google Drive. I put all of my uh, work, all my PDFs, my research PDFs, uh, starting as a grad student. I have all my research in Google Drive. The nice thing is that I can log in. I can get online. I can uh, share things out. Um, so one of the, the first steps that I did is I use Google Drive for everything. There is Dropbox. I know that um, different universities will give access to Google Drive. Um, I, I believe Southern has a Google Apps for educators. I think that you have Google Drive, at least if I remember. Um, so I save everything. And the nice thing about using the, the Southern Google Apps and Google Drive is that it's unlimited storage. So you can upload everything. Your IT people probably don't want to hear that, but you can upload everything. Uh, so you can have all of your research, all of your PDFs, your workshops, your, your, your PowerPoint materials, everything can be online. And you can share that out with students. But then the other thing that I started to do is I start using Google Docs and Drive for everything. So this PowerPoint is a Google presentation piece. I don't use Microsoft PowerPoint anymore. I use Google Docs for my syllabus, for my syllabi. I use uh, any worksheets, handouts. Everything is all in Google Drive. So when I start a class, I typically will say, here is a shared folder of everything you'll need for a class and share that out with students. So two steps. I would say start putting everything online and then start creating digital copies. Ian, we have a question. Of course. Um, I have a comment. Hi, I'm a deaf here. My comment is I use Google Drives to help my students um, operate with one another on team projects. Mm -hmm. But I haven't yet shared anything of mine with all the students through Google Drives. Uh, that, you're saying basically that's a better option than Blackboard? Did you hear that, Ian? Can you say I heard bits and pieces? Oh. Google Drive better than Blackboard. I think they are. I'm not a big fan of Blackboard. Um, I think that Blackboard can get clunky, but I think what I would do is I would have your materials in Google Drive as a backup, um, you know, and then share the links to those materials out through Blackboard. Did you have any problem when you're sharing your documents or folders through Google Drive? Do you have any concerns or problems with students, you know, viewing them? Or any, I don't know, I don't have to worry about 
I don't know, being hacked, copyright, copyright, copyright being hacked, anything like that? So what you can do is you can share a Google Doc out. Let me show this. So as an example, bah, 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 let me figure out it. We figure out this technology. All right, so if I'm in a Google, so this is a Google presentation piece now. So what I'll typically do is when I'm sharing this out with students uh, in class, I can hit share. Now there's other options here if I'm logged in. I'm logged in through my personal Gmail right now. If I was logged in through my CFC email uh, using Google Drive, I have other options that are here. But what I typically will do for students is I'm signed in now. If I go to advanced, I go down to change. So here's the important part. Uh, the first option is public on the web. So if you have a research PDF, if you have a, a Word doc, uh, a Google doc that you're working on with colleagues, if you're sharing something for public comment, you'd want that to be public on the web. That means anybody can search for it and find it. Um, so if you have materials that you are concerned that somebody's going to be able to Google and randomly find, um, that's not the option for you. If you do off, that means that it's locked down for only specific people. That's generally not a good option for you either because then what you're doing is you're limiting, you have to individually give people opportunities to uh, modify it or view it. So if you're working on a chapter or you're working on a publication and you're concerned about copyright, um, that might be you want it totally off and you want just certain individuals that you give specific permission to view. What I'll typically do is I'll use on anyone with the link. So what I can do is I do on anyone with the link and then the access, I give them access to comment. You can change it to just view, but when I send a PowerPoint out to students or the syllabus, I tell them at the beginning of class, you know, if there is a question about the syllabus, if there is a question about a PowerPoint, instead of waiting to come ask me in, in class what, you know, to, to clarify, just leave a comment on the document. Um, yes, that I'm opening myself up to stuff, but in, in the years I've done that, typically what I'll get is students that leave, um, they'll go in and leave a comment just to see if they can leave a comment or not. Um, or you'll have students that will have comments about like a, a you know, punctuation or something very minimal. Um, so I, I give them the opportunity to comment on the syllabus or comment on the PowerPoints or comment on the Word doc. Um, and then I share anyone with the link. Then what you do is you copy this link and you share that out with your students. Um, the nice thing about the difference between public on the web and anyone with the link is they have to have this specific uh, string of characters in the URL to get to this document. So your students basically have to have the ability to guess uh, all of this, the characters in the URL. But they, but they could give that to someone else once they have it. Yeah, I mean, if they share the, the, if they share the PowerPoint with another student, another student uh, or another person. They could share the URL out online and other people would view your syllabus or view your PowerPoint um, or materials for class. The other thing that you have is, and I think I can get in here. So we have one question, Ian, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Another comment. Um, they can also download things from Blackboard or we put a link to Blackboard. Many well, that's true. He was saying that if we put the link in Blackboard, they can share it that way as well. So yeah, and okay. so here's an example. So I'm logged in my CFC Google Apps right now. So if I have, I sent out quizzes before. So let me find something that would show what this could do. So if I'm here in this. Now I'm logged in through the university, so it's the same options, but then if I hit change, I have extra variables here. So one of the things you can do is use Blackboard as the gatekeeper, but then you can share this publicly on the web, but through the university, 
I can say on anyone at just CFC can find this, or I can say on anyone at CFC with the link. So they have to be logged in through their university credentials through Google Apps. So you're adding two or three steps that might block. So then what you do is, I believe Southern has Google Apps, um, but then what you do is your student has to log in and be logged in as a student at the university or a colleague has to be logged in in order to access and view that those materials. So there's opportunities to basically put a couple roadblocks in uh, in front of the students or in front of people trying to view the materials. What, we have one more question. Yeah. Southern, uh, Southern IT is driving everybody away from Google into the OWL accounts uh, okay. where we have a Microsoft um, uh, share system. The Blackboard is a learning management system and uh, Google Drive or the OneDrive for Microsoft is a sharing system. Yep. And, um, you can share everything's the same except for the fact that the Microsoft Share um, system is uh, compliant with industry standards, whereas Google is not. Google is not permitted in many private sector um, companies because it is open, because they sell information. It is considered a breach of company security and proprietary, um, proprietary risk. And so students, when they go out into the workforce, they will not be using Google in their um, work experience. They'll be using Microsoft. And so the Southern uh, IT is given two terabytes of storage information, which exceeds Google Drive, mm -hmm. um, to students. And you can, I, what I do is I create a folder for my class in my OneDrive. I just copy, I, I go into uh, Banner. I copy the email addresses from all of my students. All I have to do is say, email my class, and then it brings up an email message, and then I copy paste, I copy all the email addresses from that, the two box, mm -hmm. drop it into the share, and I share a class folder with all of my students. They, all, they, 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 can, they have to log in through their OWL in order to access the folder, and then anything I throw into that folder is automatically shared with everybody who has permission access that folder. And so the Microsoft, um, it, it's industry compliant. It's um, uh, compliant with uh, Southern IT. Um, mm -hmm. has all of the same benefit, as the same uh, functions of the Google Drive. Um, however, it's private. And Microsoft doesn't sell the information. And, um, and uh, Southern is hosting two terabytes of information. Yeah, I mean, that's a great option. Um, I think that here I got an email this morning. I never knew any of that. Well, I, I, I'm in professional communication, and, and so I, uh, I, I, that's that's my specialization. <laughs> so how long did it take you to get that up and running? That transition just in the spring. Right. So it's, it's fairly new. Yeah, we got it's new it's really software. New. No one showed us what was there. You just kind of had to figure it out yourself. It was a handful of training classes, like the new phones. Yeah. Got a new phone. What are you supposed to do? I don't know. Why well, can make a call? I can't do anything else. Yeah, I'm trying. I want to put a ticket on there. I want to activate my voicemail. <laughs> voicemail is gone. Everything comes in as an email. Yeah. Okay. You don't need voicemail anymore. Yeah. Okay. So we just learned something. You can check your voicemail because they're all in your. I can't set my own preferences because yeah. I don't have my own access to it. We just we just learned something because not everybody in the room knew we had the Microsoft OneDrive, so now we know. So yeah. we'll have to go all set that up this afternoon. So. Well, no. Every time you go to send an attachment, it's one of the three choices. Yeah. But I didn't know what it was because okay. I never did that. I always said, I know I'm sending yeah. a file. I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. The Microsoft OneDrive works is compliant seamlessly with your Microsoft yeah, Office. It's all the same thing. You can save directly from Microsoft Word to your OneDrive. Mm -hmm. You can edit online. Um, Google is not compliant with Microsoft products. Okay. And the thing to keep in mind also is that um, I just got an email yesterday or two days ago about my university is changing over to you know Office 365. So there's all of these different initiatives and all these different products that are out there. Um, but the challenge is when new initiatives come in, is there the infrastructure in place to help train all of you to figure out how to use it? And then once you start using it and you get embedded in the system and you really value it, then they change. 
and then the people that were in one system, then all of a sudden they're left behind, and it's like, well, I was using this, I figured out how to use it, and now you're changing the system. Um, 100% correct on the, the pieces about Google. Google's main business is to get you to use more Google. Um, that's what they're there for. Uh, they initially started as, and they make most of their money in advertising, but they want you to use more Google, so they learn more about you, so that increases their value. Um, I have a lot of issues with Google and what they do um, and that business model, um, but most of the tools that I use are the, the best for what I need to do. Um, you need to think about what your students need and what your students want, what the what their ultimate employers will need and what, what, what they will want. Um, my viewpoint is that you want to use different different tools and different skill sets for those tools and build up your students so that they can go out and perform in any marketplace and any you know job using whatever tools that they'll have there. Um, I use all the free Google stuff because most of my students will be teachers and they'll go teach in environments that don't have the support and don't have um, the the access to the technology. Um, but I, yeah, I mean the, the Microsoft tools work well um, and it might be something very simple as uh, in, in many of our institutions, we have shared drives, so people have the opportunity to share Word docs on their computer as opposed to just share it to a shared drive, and then you can log in at home in a different classroom, uh, different spaces. So think about how do I get my teaching materials, my content, you know, quote unquote online. How do I get it into the cloud so that I can access it whenever I need to, but then also my students can access it when they need to. Good questions, good comments. You would think, one would think, yes. One would think there's an change, but it's already in the cloud, right. so it will be incremental as opposed to maybe right. differential. No, we're going from XP right. to you know, Windows 8 and all that crap. I just recently uh, had to bring my laptop over to the help desk, and they were talking about the OneDrive. This is like within the last couple of weeks. Yeah. They set it up so that every document that I do, you know, in my own folder, gets automatically gets saved to the OneDrive, which I didn't even know that was an option because I was like, oh wait a minute, I got to move that or something. Because no, we'll just do it automatically. So all these things that we that we have that we get, we're not using because we don't know how either they are there or how to use them. So. And that's the challenge is that you know, like something like the share drive that's been around for a long time and then people would say, well, I don't know how to use it, I don't know how to access it, so they would slowly fold. Now they just say, okay, we're just going to put everybody online. And then, you know, some of us that were, were already doing it, we have access to it, we see the value, but then others are like, well, what can I do with this? Um, and that brings me to the, the last pieces, and it's a good transition point, is how much time do we have left? Like 15 minutes? Uh, yeah, about 15. Yep. All right. So one of the last things that I was going to suggest is um, as you start and, and build up all of this stuff and as you start figuring out, make conscious decisions about how you move it to these digital spaces, is start to build up a, a learning hub. You know, this is one of the things that I talked about at the end of our time, uh, you know, previously, but... You're building up all of this content. You're pulling all of these digital pieces together, these digital texts together. Uh, there is an opportunity to build up one space where you build and share everything. Um, this might be a space that lives uh, totally online in your in Blackboard, or it lives online. Uh, my university is moving over to Yammer as opposed to the listserv. There's a lot of consternation around that. Um, but one of the things that I do is I have a website where I house all of my materials there. You know, so you can build up your materials and start to share them at your website. So frequently what I'll do is for my classes, I will, um, if I use Blackboard or our version of Blackboard here, um, what I'll do is I'll have my modules and my sections for my classes on a website that I build for the students. Um, and then I can share that with colleagues, share that with other people in the field, but it's slowly started to build up and archive all of your stuff over over time in a place that you control. And the, the reason why I think that's important is as things change, as different initiatives change, 
as we move from one tool or one platform to another platform. Um, and as I said, you know, when we last met, if you ultimately, you know, if you decide to change institutions, you know, if you move, then, you know, or the, or the university or institution moves you, <laughs> where does your stuff go? Okay, is your content still there in those files, in those drives? Is it still in, the, in Blackboard and does it live there? Um, or, but do you have the opportunity to build that over time? Yes, this has a lot of questions about intellectual property. This has a lot of questions about ownership. This has a lot of questions about um, the tenure and promotion process and all of those elements. I know that those questions all live there. Um, but there is an opportunity to think, as we're thinking about you know, sharing our content and building these online spaces, can I create one hub that builds up my digital identity? Okay, a website where I choose what to share, what not to share. Um, so, like I said, I do this. Um, when I think about my workflow, I want two aspects to my workflow. I pretty much want stuff that's device agnostic and I want ubiquitous access to my data. We've talked a little bit about this already. Uh, one is I want device agnostic. I use a lot of different tools in my life. I use, I'm on a, a MacBook now. I've got uh, PCs in my teaching labs and classrooms here. I use an Android device. I've got an iPad. Um, I have a, an Apple, uh, I've got a, a MacBook at home that I use and an iMac at home that I use, but then PCs. Um, we have e-readers. We have all sorts of different devices. For the most part, I need my content to be accessible across all of those devices. More importantly, I need my content, my teaching materials for my students to be accessible across those spaces. Um, because when I teach, some of my students will come in with a nice brand new MacBook Air, um, but then a lot of my students, when I have them read a document in class or work on something in class, some of them will be viewing on a little iPhone, not even the nice big new iPhone. Um, so our students are going to come in and want to use these different devices. They'll be on Kindles, they'll be on iPhones, they'll be on Android, they'll be on all sorts of different things. Can they access and use your materials across those spaces? And then uh, the, the more important thing for me is I need ubiquitous access to my data. I need to be able to get everything anywhere that I am. Um, I need to, you know, this PowerPoint that we're looking at now, uh, last week I started it at work. I was working on it here in the office. I uh, left. I went home and worked on it several times over the weekend. Um, I didn't worry about where did I save that. Did I, you know, did I email it to myself? I just logged in at home through my Google account, or you know, you could use your Microsoft credentials. I logged in. I continued to edit and work from home. I didn't have to worry about what was the most up-to-date version. I came back here to the office, logged in, and this is the most up-to-date version, for better or worse. Um, and I don't have to worry about where it disappears to. You know, the dog didn't eat my homework. I have access to my stuff wherever I am. Um, if I came in here and we saw the, the technical difficulties getting signed up. If I go to my classroom and the computer crashes, you know, in my, in my classroom when I'm teaching, I can log in online and get to my materials. I can plug my phone or my laptop in. If our, you know, if my MacBook and all of us have had it happen to us, you know, you, your MacBook crashes on the way to a conference, you have, uh, you, as long as you can get to the cloud, you can get to your materials. Um, so I need that as I as I work online, and, and one of the points is that uh, I have the device agnostic policy and also the ubiquitous access element to it, and I share everything to uh, my learning hub, my website. So if I I did not do it for this presentation, once we get the videos, we'll have it out there. Um, but I put everything on my website. I know there's broader questions, but I put it on my website mainly because I want you to have access to it. I want you to be able to go back, get access to it, review it at a later date. Um, this is a hybrid presentation, you know, so I was there face to face with you. Um, now I'm coming in virtually. There are different people that are at different points in the learning process. So, it, you know, this is also a bit of hybrid learning here. You know, I'm, I'm coming in virtually, different people are at different points, they have different 
uh, comfortability uh, with what I'm talking about. So there's the opportunity to connect with and go back to those materials over time. And I want to make it as easy as possible for you to get to those materials and not worry about where did I share it, what was it, email, you know, how do I get back to that guy's content. That's one of the reasons why I'm sharing all this stuff online. Um, so one of the things that I suggest is, you know, once you start putting your materials together and, and pulling them together, is there an opportunity to put together one spot, one place where everything lives? Um, you know, you can either use it just as an archive or you can use it uh, as, a, as a way to share out with others. Question? I just have one question. Oh, did you have a question? I just have one question. What are you using to have uh, to have them build the website and ultimately their portfolio? What? There's a lot of different options. One of the things that I use, all right, so I use WordPress. Yeah. Um, I use WordPress. I know that there is a pretty steep learning curve to WordPress. Um, yeah. Typically, what I'll do with my students is uh, I use WordPress, like I said. With WordPress, there is WordPress.com. That's the free hosted version. There is WordPress.org, so see .com, and it's terribly confusing. But the .org part is one that you can um, you host it yourself. So as long as you're paying the hosting bills, your stuff stays online, um, and you own all of that. Uh, I use, for my hosting, I use Reclaim Hosting. Uh, there are people in education. The pricing is pretty cheap. Uh, it's basically $25 a year for the hosting. So you can pay $25 a year. I pay $45 because I host a couple websites. Um, but it's $25 to $45 a year. Get a domain. Um, so it could be carolstewart.com, and you start to build up your stuff. I build mine in WordPress. Um, there is also... Uh, some of my students, if you want something that's very simple, a lot of my students use Wix. Yep. Uh, you know, Wix is very easy. It's drag and drop. It's basically an opportunity to... Am I sharing my screen? Or is it just me? What's the, we see you. All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, so... Okay. So I use WordPress. Yep, I've used um, WordPress. Yep. WordPress, I love. Uh, there's numerous reasons why. Uh, WordPress, the .com, is the uh, free version. The .org is the version that you can host. Right. I use Reclaim Hosting as my... I, there's GoDaddy, and I know that this might be like foreign language, but Reclaim Hosting is the relatively inexpensive hosting company that I use. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my students in the past use Wix uh, to run their website. Wix is nice because it's very simple. It's drag and drop. Within a couple hours, you can build up a nice site that looks professional. It shows a good digital identity. Um, some of my students also use uh, Weebly. Now, if they use Wix or Weebly, do they still have to get hosting themselves, or will those places host it as well? So what will happen is uh, WordPress, what they'll do is they you can do the WordPress. So my students, I make them have a digital portfolio. Right. So they, they start with WordPress.com, and right. WordPress hosts it for them <laughs> because... Okay. You know, they can choose to pay for hosting later, but I don't want them to pay for anything yet. They use the free version. If they want to buy a domain, uh, Wix and Weebly, you can start with free versions and build it up over time, and then when they, uh, if they want to, they can pay for their own hosting at a later date. Okay. At this point, most of my students use Weebly um, because it, Wix is a little. Wix is very, very easy. It's very easy to get stuff up and running that looks professional. Um, they use these for digital portfolios. Uh, WordPress for many of them is too hard to figure out. Uh, I sit down and give a lot of hands-on guidance. Uh, this summer I have another class where we'll do the same. Weebly is a, a is in between. Weebly okay. 
Yeah, especially in business, there's a lot of push recently from Weebly where they're showing business owners how to get up and running, um, use that for marketing, use it for presentation and building up your digital identity, um, all of that stuff. Those are the ones that I recommend um, for building that, that learning hub. Did anybody have any other questions? Okay, and um, th thank you very much, by the way. I, sorry about the technical difficulties. No, 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 no. It, the technology is overrated. Oh, right? That's normal. That's normal. That's to be expected. Um, but this is, once you, once you end this session, it will be um, out on um, YouTube. Would you send me that link, and then I'll send everybody here in the room your original, uh, you know, the time you came up to Connecticut, I'll send them that link, and I'll send this link as well. Of course. Yeah, I'll send all this stuff out. This will share as a, as a YouTube video. Um, okay. I will put it up on the website. Um, I'll share out the materials from the link from before. Um, you know, I'll also share the link out. I put together a weekly newsletter on all of this stuff um, so that people are trying to understand it, uh, make, hopefully make it a little bit easier, uh, make sense of it. Right. Thank you very much. Not Thank a you. problem. <laughs> Thanks a lot for uh, allowing me in. It's, uh, hopefully the rain will pass soon. Good yeah. Oh, did it stop? Yeah. No, yeah, now, now it's going to be hot and humid tomorrow. So oh, from the rain to hot and humid. I know. Well, at least it's not snow. So. Yeah. No I just kidding. noticed my battery, my battery's running out, so I have to end it. So. All right. Well, I'll see you guys soon. It's good to say hi to everybody again. Thank you, Ian. Not a problem. I'll see you. Okay.